Let's see, I'm gonna mute myself real quick. Can you like welcome everybody? All right. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us for the live q and I see Stan, Ronald, Richard, Ashley, uh, people coming in right now. If you wanna say hi, just uh, pop into the chat, say hi, tell us where you're uh, joining us from. And if you have any questions, um, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Sometimes in the chat, they get lost um, with all the comments and everything. So if you can put the questions that you have in the Q&A, uh, that's that way we can make sure we get them answered. We can see everything. I think I got my microphone fixed. <laughs> cool. <laughs> kind of messed up. All right. Awesome. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Did we have any questions that were... We have a couple of questions that were emailed in already, right? So we can probably start with one of those just to get yep, started. Yep, we did. Yep. So cool. let's uh, go with the first one. Let me see here. Okay. So one question we had was uh, most of my clients come from direct referral from CPAs and attorneys. I'm a bankruptcy attorney. Any thoughts on how to increase this stream of business? Uh, how to increase, I guess, are they asking how to increase the referrals that they get? Yeah, the referrals from their other other attorneys and CPAs that they get, I guess, in the bankruptcy area. That's common. Mm. Yeah. So. Um, so one of the ways that I would do it, if I'm trying to get other people to, I mean, it's kind of a it's kind of a value thing. Like if if you can provide value to them, then they can provide value back to you. Um, that that's that's probably one of the biggest things that I would do. Like, so if you're trying to get referrals one of the things that I always make sure to do when I get, when I get a referral from anybody is I always send them a physical thank you. Some, you know, something like, so for, for us, you know, a client is, is worth a, a decent amount of money and most, uh, most law firms clients are worth a decent amount of money. So every referral could potentially be worth a few thousand dollars. I mean, if it's, you know, if you're an injury law firm, it could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. It could be worth millions of dollars. Who knows? Um, but what I, people put, put a higher value on a physical item. So one of the hacks, just kind of like one of the life hacks that I have is when I want people to kind of, it's like, it's almost like uh, reinforcing behavior. Um, but what I do is I always send a physical item as a thank you. So for example, we had somebody that, um, we had somebody that referred a client to us about a year ago. And I know that they're, they're really into whiskey. They're like really big whiskey drinkers. So I went on, I went on Fa or not Facebook. I went on like Amazon or I went somewhere and I found this like whiskey lovers sampler pack or something like that. And I sent that to them and that one, I mean, it cost me like 250 bucks, but the client that they referred was, you know, a client that pays us several thousand dollars a month. So it was totally worth it. And since then they have actually sent me more and I've continued to send them, you know, physical thank you items. Um, so that's part of it, you know, is, is kind of almost like training them. That if they refer, if they refer business to attorney A, uh, that attorney is only going to give them an email that says, Hey, thanks for the client. Uh, but if, if you refer them business, then they're going to get, uh, some sort of, you know, actual physical thing that they like. Um, another thing is be sure to refer out business as much as you can. Um, obviously if you're not a, if you're not a, uh, 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 if you're talking about like a CPA or a financial planner or something like that, and you're a bankruptcy attorney, then um, you're not competing with one another. So you can kind of like form partnerships with people. Um, and, and really like, you know, it's, it's tough because it's kind of like, do you have one go-to guy that has a lot of business that can, that you guys can refer a lot of business to, or are you trying to get referrals from a lot of different people? And you have to kind of make a choice because if you're trying, if there's like one guy who just has a ton of work and is willing to give you a lot of referrals. If you can form a partnership with them and actually do like co-promoting and stuff like that. And even, I mean, honestly, even do like a Facebook group and like, like co-promote everything where um, you guys are going to work together um, to, to, to grow both of your businesses. That's probably the best way to do it. Honestly, instead of doing, instead of going one to many and trying to get a bunch of people to refer you business, find somebody that's already successful that works just as hard as you do. And, um, form partnerships with them, do co-webinars, do stuff like that. When this whole COVID-19 thing happened, um, I teamed up with a lot of different uh, people that were targeting lawyers because obviously I'm, you know, I do marketing, I target lawyers. 
Um, and, but we weren't competitors. So for example, we did one with um, Answering Legal and we had a thousand people in that webinar. And what was cool about that is that, um, you know, they're targeting lawyers, we're targeting lawyers, but we're not competing with one another because they, they do answering the phones and I do marketing, you know? So based on that, we both benefited and we both got a bunch of clients out of that. So if you do stuff like that, that that's another way to enhance that relationship and then you'll start getting more referrals. Um, but you know, if you're just trying to go one to many, you're trying to get one, a bunch of different people, then make sure that you, you know, make it work, make, it's like everything else. It's like, what's in it for me, you know? So if you can make it more valuable to them, then they'll give you referrals. Awesome. Uh, and so I see a lot more people have joined us. So, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and leave them in the Q and a section and we'll go ahead and get to them. Yeah. I think we missed a lot of questions that were posted in the chat last week. Yeah, yeah, it's just the comments coming in, they kind of get lost. So the Q&A yeah. section is definitely... Hey, was that, Chase, was that an emailed question? That was an email question, but okay, I know cool. who emailed it. So if you want All right, to. so uh, by the way, if you ask a question and I answer it, then uh, I'm going to do the same thing I did last week and give away. I've got a bunch of books that, um, I don't know if you guys, anybody that's followed me for a while knows that I'm, I'm in a different office now. So my last office, um, I had, I still have the bookshelf, but I just had way too many books on it that I'm never going to read again. So I was kind of like, well, why don't I, uh, just give them away? <laughs> so it's, I've got, I'm basically giving away all the books that, uh, I haven't, uh, I'm not reading anymore. Um, so if you ask a question and I answer it, then, uh, I will also give you a free book from my bookshelf. So it's better than, I don't know. This is my wife's idea. <laughs> I was just going <laughs> to give them away, but my wife was like, why don't you give them away on your, uh, to your group? Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, so yeah, we have uh, another question here from Leonard Boyer. Okay. Uh, he asked, uh, what's the best way to make people aware that the courts are open and that the pandemic will not protect them from legal action? Uh, here in New Jersey, people have been lulled into a false sense of security. How mm -hmm. can we wake them up? Um, I would do the PSA style videos. Like, uh, is Leonard in here? Did he ask in the chat or is he asking the Q&A? He asked in the Q&A. Okay, what, what practice area? Hey, guys, by the way, when you ask a question, make sure to include your practice area and like kind of like what you do. Yeah, great point. Yeah, so. Leonard, can you put in the chat what your practice area is? Because um, I can give you some general advice. Basically, what I would do is I would do the, Q, uh, the, the um, PSA style marketing that I, I talk about all the time. And let's just say, and I don't know what type of law you are, but let's, let's say... Um, let's say you're a real estate attorney because that's a, that's a hot topic right now. I know in Florida, uh, just two days ago, they, um, two, two days ago, they basically extended the, uh, uh, what's it called? A moratorium on, on evictions. Basically they said you can't be evicted for another 30 days. Right. So that's something that, um, a lot of people probably don't know the answer to that. And, and a lot of landlords maybe even think that they can just, uh, go to someone, go to their house uh, go to their, their rental property and say, okay, get out and, you know, <laughs> basically physically remove the people and go in and take all their stuff out and throw it away. Um, yeah. Leonard but, uh, did say he's in bankruptcy, mortgage foreclosure, defense, and civil litigation. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So let me know in the chat what kind of what, like what, what laws people are skating around, but I'll just finish my thought with this one. Um, so, so basically a lot of people maybe don't realize that you're not allowed to do this like self-help eviction or whatever it's called. That, that, they call it self-help eviction. That's kind of like the, 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 the slang for it, I guess. But I'm sure there's a real term for it. But what you could do if you're a, a foreclosure attorney is you could do that PSA style marketing type thing. So what you could do is you could create a video and you could say, hey, everybody, uh, you know, Leonard here, I'm a real estate attorney. I know you're not a real estate attorney, but uh, as you got, and, and you, you would post this on your personal page. That, that's the other thing. So what you're going to do is you're actually going to get your friends and your family to help you spread the word. So you're going to say, Hey everybody, Leonard here, as you guys know, I'm a real estate attorney and governor DeSantis just signed something today that is putting a, put, basically putting a hold on all evictions for 30 days. So there's a lot of people that don't know what this means. And I want to clear it up for you. So the first thing is that you cannot be evicted from a rental property or an apartment or anything like that for 30 days. However, that does not mean that you are excused from paying your rent. So if you can pay your rent, you need to make sure that you can, that you pay it, or you need to make sure that you contact your landlord and make sure that basically you're working out some sort of, some sort of deal with them. If you need some negotiation tips, send me a direct message and I'll help you. Um, now, if you're a landlord and you have a tenant that is not paying the rent, 
what you need to do uh, according to the law is you need to reach out to that landlord or that, reach out to that tenant and see if you can actually work a deal out with them and get them to pay something so that they're at least kind of getting caught up. Um, unfortunately, you cannot evict them right now. You, you, the courts will not allow you to do it. And not only that, and more importantly, you cannot go to the property and physically remove them. That's illegal. It's against the law. You cannot do it. So if you know, so if you're a landlord and you have questions or you need any help like that, then feel free also to shoot me a direct message or, you know, give me a call or shoot me a text or whatever it is, send me an email and I'll help you out and I'll point you in the right direction. So what you do is you post that video out there and you put um, in the, in the subject and actually you can say it in the video, Hey, please share this video. Um, but what you can do is you can put in the, in the status update, you can say, uh, please share this video. If you are a, you know, uh, say, say, please share this video. If you know any, any landlords or anyone renting, you know, um, and what will happen is because that video has a lot of value, then what will happen is your friends and your family will watch the video and they'll actually share it. We've done this and we've had clients, uh, actually in April, we had a client who did this, um, and he did a few of these videos and he got, he had, I, actually he, he had the best, the best month in the history of his law firm. Last month we did this for another attorney and he had the second, mo second busiest month in the history of his law firm. So this is stuff that's working right now. And what's cool is that it's completely free. You literally just have to pick up your phone and record some value, some value information. But the idea is that you want to, you want to disguise it as a public service announcement. You don't want to make it an ad. You don't want to make it salesy. That's why I said the call to action is you have any questions, send me a direct message. Now, the other thing to think about is that when they look, when, when people are messaging you, if you're not friends with them on Facebook or Instagram, then what's going to happen is it's going to go to your filtered messages. So you need to look up. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head how you do it, but you need to look up on, on Google or go to YouTube and find out how do you find filtered messages on Facebook and Instagram. And actually everyone should do that anyway. Cause if you go in there, you're probably going to find some interesting stuff. Um, but honestly, uh, Leonard, I, I would just give you, I, you know, whatever, whatever it is that people need to know, need to know, I would do that exact same thing. I would just keep doing videos like that. And here's the thing. It might not work the first time. It might not work the second time, but if you keep doing it and you're consistent with it, it's actually a marketing strategy you can use for the rest of your career. It just needs to be something that's informative that a lot of people need to know. That's why I call it PSA. Um, you, 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 cover, you basically do it like it's a public service announcement. Um, and if you do that, you're going to have a lot of success, especially if you're consistent with it. So that's, that's my thought on that. Awesome. Yeah. Leonard had said, uh, for example, people don't understand that forbearance is only applicable to mortgages. Uh, held or backed by a federal government agency. So yeah. that's really important. Okay, so that's great. Yeah, so you can say, hey, everybody, anybody that has a mortgage needs to pay attention to this video, especially if you've gotten a forbearance. If you don't know what a forbearance is, then you should probably watch this video also because I'm going to explain it to you. And I'm also going to explain the three little tricks that mortgage companies use when they actually when you sign up for a forbearance. And what you don't realize is that this forbearance it will it will give you some relief right now, but it could cost you thousands of dollars in the future. And then you go into the video and you talk about it and, and you know, and, and just provide really good information. Don't be salesy. Just, just, just your goal should be to help people and to give people information. And then when that happens, they'll share it. And when the video is valuable enough, they'll share it. You know, it's like a lot of times people are just like, I did it once and it didn't work or I did it twice and it didn't work. And the reality is, is that means that the information wasn't valuable enough. That, that's just what it means. I mean, it's like, you know, people vote, you know, like, like, it's like when you have, when you have a pro when I have a product that I'm trying to sell, uh, you know, people vote with their credit cards. If nobody buys it, then it's clear that nobody wants it, right? So it's same thing. Like, you know, people vote with their, the share button. People, if, if they're not engaging, if they're not commenting, then it's probably not that interesting. Um, so just try again. It doesn't mean that, that, that you failed. It just means, okay, this one didn't work. Let's try something different. You know, there's, that, 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 that's, that's how I would do it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it could be really helpful for people who, I know mortgage is kind of crazy with who owns them and who doesn't. So how to yeah, tell exactly. if you're, yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't don't know much about mortgages. Right. So, how to tell if it is backed by a federal government agency could be really helpful too. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's so, probably 50 topics that you could. I mean, if we sat here, you'd probably come up with like 50 <laughs> topics right off the top of our head. Yeah. Uh, so that was Leonard. If you want to uh, give him or uh, do the book. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, so. Um, all right. Let's go with. Tiger Tactics. All right. So here's the deal. I have uh, a couple copies of this book. <laughs> I got, I got a couple copies. So I, I do have one, but, um, this is a really good book. It's written by, actually, I know a lot of the attorneys that wrote this book. Um, so yeah, uh, Bill Umansky, Bill, the lawman, uh, Jay Ruane, uh, Billy Tarask. How do you pronounce her last name? 
Tarascio, I think. I don't know. I had dinner with her at Max LawCon. So yeah, I actually know a lot of people that wrote this book. It's a really good book. Um, and it basically teaches you how to grow a law firm. Uh, so I've got uh, actually a couple copies of this book. So I'm going to give one of these away. So go ahead and grab uh, Leonard's address and we'll, uh, we'll get him a copy of that. Awesome. And thanks for your question, Leonard. Uh, so now we have a question from Ronald. Um, he's interested in doing business succession slash estate planning. I'm concerned mm -hmm. that people looking for this type of planning won't be on Facebook or other social media. What's your experience? I think everyone's on social media. <laughs> so it's business succession. Okay, so who are we interested in? We're interested in people that are probably getting towards the age of retirement that are, um, you know, interested in business things. I think that even on Facebook, you can even target small business owner, you know, um, you can target. Uh, and then on top of that, you can target interests that people would have. So for example, let's say uh, we're going after people that own restaurants and they want to pass their restaurant down to their kids, right? Uh, you can probably target restaurant owner. I'm not sure if you can, but there's a lot of other things that restaurant owners are interested in. Uh, and when I say interested in meaning like, like different websites that they'll go to and different products that they'll purchase that are specific to business owners. So like, for example, um, yeah, actually I, know, I own a brewery, right? So I know that we use, uh, we use a, a, um, uh, the cash, cash register software, whatever it's called. I can't remember what it is, but it's called toast, right? I, I bet you toast is, is targetable. So if you're interested in that, then there's a good chance you own a business. And then if you're interested in that and you're in your fifties or in your sixties, there's a good chance you own your business and you're at least thinking about what you're going to do for retirement. Probably even in your forties, you're thinking, of, I mean, heck, I'm 36 and I'm thinking about retirement. <laughs> so like, you know, um, but basically that's what you need to do. That, that's the way you target them, right? So you can go on Facebook. Facebook knows everything about everyone um, and everyone's on Facebook. So, you know, uh, actually all, older people are on Facebook. Like my, my 14 year old daughter's not on Facebook, but both of my parents, my, my mom is like 68. My dad's 72. They're constantly on Facebook. Um, you know, all of their friends are on Facebook. Everyone's on Facebook. So, um, but what you need to do is you need to figure out like, what are the things that they're thinking right now? Um, you know, as they get older, what are the things that they're worried about? What are the things that they're afraid about, afraid of? Um, what are the things that, you know, kind of keep them up at night? And then what you do is you just create content uh, that helps them solve those problems. So it's, it's literally like a three-step process. It's basically the first thing you do is pull out a piece of paper and write down all the problems that your ideal clients have and all the things that they're afraid of and all the things that, that they don't want to happen. And I'm sure that by now, you know, somebody could walk in the door, your ideal client could walk in the door and you probably know the 10 questions they're going to ask or the five questions they're going to ask every single time. And that's what you need to focus on, right? And then you pull out your phone just like this and you record a video talking about, hey, are you a small business, are you a small business owner and you really want to retire but you want to make sure that your business stays in the family and that creditors can't overrun. I don't, I don't know what the problem is, you know, but, uh, the, and if that sounds like you, then you need to watch this video. Cause I'm going to show you three ways to keep your business in the family and make sure that, you know, your, your kids can't run it into the ground or whatever. Right. Um, and then it's the same, it's literally the same, the same thing. You just, you, you talk, you, you give some really good information and then you say, you know, if you have any questions, then, uh, you know, and actually what you would do is you, you run this as Facebook ads. So from there you can, my favorite thing to do is actually create a cheat sheet. So I would say like, you know, if you want to learn three ways to make sure that your kids don't run your business into the ground or three ways to make sure that, um, you know, your kids, that your business stays in the family or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, um, you can give some information about it and say, if you want to learn more then click the link, include this video and grab our free cheat sheet. That's going to show you seven, you know, seven mistakes business owners make when they are passing their businesses down to their kids and how you can avoid it, you know, or how, you know, seven mistakes business owners make when they're thinking of, you know, right before, right before retirement that, that costs them thousands of dollars. Right. And you just do like an ebook or a cheat sheet or something like that. So it's like a free download. And what's cool about that is that you can require them to enter their email address. And now you have their email address so you can follow up with them every single day. Anyone that is on my email list, and I think probably everyone on here is on my email list because I think we only advertise this to my email list. You know you get an email from me every day. And there's a reason for that. It's not because I like writing emails. It's because follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, and eventually someone's gonna buy something from you. Um, so that's, 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 the, that's the biggest thing. So step one is figuring out their problems. Step two is uh, create videos 
and I said videos, plural, that solve each individual problem. And then step three is run those videos as ads and get their email address and then just keep following up with them with, with more valuable information, not sales pitches, just valuable information. You just, I mean, honestly, it's the same thing I do. I figure out what are the problems that lawyers have. I create videos that solve the problems. And then I say, you know, if you want to learn how to do this thing, join my email list. And then I email you every day uh, until you buy something for me or unsubscribe. <laughs> you know, So that's that's the strategy. And that it, it works for literally every business in the world. It's not, it's not unique to me. It's not unique to law firms. It's not unique to e-commerce. It works for literally everything. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, that was Ronald Axelrod. All right. Uh, also, by the way, make, if you got a book last week, there's only one, we're only doing one book per person. <laughs> one, all right. And uh, I just want to uh, reiterate, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them in the Q and A section. I see some people ask them in chat. So just put them in the Q&A. All right. High Performance Habits by Brennan Burchard. This is really good. It's, it's basically a, uh, it's, it's a productivity book. It's really good. So I'm going to send uh, High Performance Habits. Awesome. Okay. So uh, next up, we've got uh, Stuart Sandweiss. That's the question. Hey, Stuart. Hey, Stuart. Uh, what's up? Yeah. He says, in this internet age, is there any advantage to getting a local vanity number? Um... Maybe, you know, honestly on, so the problem that I have with a local vanity number, like it's good if you're going to be running like TV ads and stuff like that. And, and the reason that you have a local vanity number truly is so that somebody remembers your, your phone number because you know, 1-800 I love brand new carpets is better than uh 1-800-278-4196, you know? So if, if you're running TV commercials, if you're doing billboards, if you're doing something like that, then a vanity number is, is probably necessary. However, um, I would also say that if you're running, you know, billboards or TV commercials, you should probably have a different phone number on each one so you can actually figure out where the phone calls are coming from. Um, because if you can't track it, then you can't measure it. And if you can't measure it, then you can't really, you don't know anything about it, you know? And that's one of the biggest problems with TV and billboards and radio and all that type of stuff. So it's, it's give or take, you know, it's basically, are they going to remember the phone number and call you or are you not going to, um, are you not going to uh, be able to figure out where the phone calls are coming from? That's why I like Facebook because they don't necessarily have to remember the phone number because there's a lot of different options. Uh, and I say Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, social media, right? Um, and then email also. So basically, uh, you can have different phone numbers for different things. They don't necessarily, if you, if you actually do a good remarketing campaign, a good remarketing strategy, then if they forgot your phone number, um, then it's okay because they're going to see you again in five minutes. I mean, that's the whole thing. Like, I don't even put my phone number out there. I, most people probably don't even know my, my website address because I've got so many different ones. By the way, we just launched andrewstickle.com literally like three hours ago. Uh, so you guys should check it out. Let me know what you think. And Chase, uh, Chase actually worked pretty hard on that. Um, so, but that's the thing. I mean, if, 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 if somebody, pretty much anyone that's on this, uh, if, if you needed to get in touch with me and you, and, and you, you didn't, you didn't know my email address or you didn't, you know, you, you could pretty much just go into Facebook or go into YouTube and wait a couple minutes and, and you're going to see me, you know? So, um, that, that's the whole thing is that if you're, you know, if you're going to use the mediums that I talked about, then, you know, maybe, uh, but it's also a catch 22 because if you have that number, then you're not going to be able to, uh, to track it, especially have multiple places. If you're running one TV ad on one channel or one billboard or something like that, then, then maybe that would work. But, um, I, I think, uh, you know, in the internet, it's probably not as necessary. Okay, great. Um, so that was Stuart. Uh, if you want to choose anything there. All right, let's go with, uh, millionaire success habits by okay. Dean Graziosi. Actually, I think I gave another copy of this away, didn't I? Last yeah, week? you did. I've got, I've got a couple of those. All right. So I'm just trying to keep track of those. Okay. So the next question we have from Dev, he says, any advice on targeting employment law clients who have been made unfairly dismissed from their jobs? He's currently in the UK. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. So what you can do, what's, what's kind of cool about that is that Employment law, I've always found employment law is really easy to generate leads for because uh, most people that got fired are usually upset about it. Um, so what you can do is um, 
you, you can, my favorite thing to do, if, if I had an employment law firm, what I would do is I would create a free guide of some sort that is called like four, four ways or four times your, I'm so bad at coming up with titles when I'm talking, I'm better at typing them out, but basically like, you know, four ways that employers illegally fire employees and, uh, and how much money you may be owed. I, that's really not that great of a title, but something along those lines, right? Something that's basically where if they were fired, they, they're gonna look at it and think, oh, wait a second, maybe I was fired illegally and I might be owed money. You know? So like that would be, that, that, that's, that's getting the interest and the curiosity, right? And then what you do is you put it on a landing page um, and you, you run Facebook ads that are basically saying, uh, if you were fired, um, then, you know, if you, if you were fired, then there's a good chance that it was done illegally. Um, now, I created a free guide that shows you four ways that employers routinely illegally fire employees and, you know, how we've been able to help get employer, employees compensated when they're fired illegally, right? If you want to get a free copy of this guide, cl uh, click the link, include this video, and then on the next page, enter your name and your email address and we'll email you a copy, right? Um, and what's cool about that is now you've got their name and their email address and you can pretty much run that pretty, you can run that as a Facebook ad pretty wide. I've actually never advertised in the UK, so I'm not entirely sure what the targeting options are. I would imagine that they're probably okay. They're not as good as the US, but they're probably okay. Um, but honestly, you could really probably run that pretty wide. Um, and what I would do is make sure that you have like, um, a really good pattern interrupt. So the first line of the copy should be something like anyone recently fired from their job needs to see this, right? And then on my videos, I always have the red, hey, law hey lawyers, right? Um, so you can't say, have you recently been fired? Because Facebook won't allow that. But you could say something like um, uh, four ways. So, so basically, um, employers fire, you want to make it, you know, like employers fire employees illegally all the time, dot, 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 or something like that, you know, something that's going to get their interest because it kind of calls them out. And then what you're going to do is you're just going to follow up with them on a regular basis, providing value and, you know, the biggest problems that, that people have. Uh, and, 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 and that's how I would do it. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. If you go to lawyermasterclass.com, um, you can see actually a pretty detailed instruction on how to actually watch. It's about an hour long video. It shows you how to run that entire process. Um, and then the other side to that also is that after they download the free guide, after they give you their email address, I would push them into a Facebook group um, and uh, make it like a, you know, employee, employees rights Facebook group, um, you know, like UK employee rights or London employee rights or wherever, you know, whatever city you're located in. Um, and, and then you just create content and put it in there also. And it's, I mean, it's same strategy I use. That's what I would do. Awesome. And that was dev. So in the UK, I don't know about in the UK. Books. You know what? I, I think that UK, I don't know how much shipping's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> We're doing media mail. Let, let me see. Hold on. All right. I'm going with the lightest book I can find. Uh, <laughs> 2000 Social Media Marketing Tricks. I've actually not read this book, but somebody gave it to me. Awesome. So I don't know. So I'm going to send you that unless the shipping's like $40. <laughs> In which case, maybe I'll send you an Amazon gift card to just buy it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, Dev, if you can put your uh, your address in the chat, we can try and get that to you. Uh, next, we had uh, Jason had emailed other questions in, so uh, he asked about that. Um, okay. We already answered one. Do you recommend any particular program for getting reviews? Bird's Eye, Gather Us, or another one? And any um, suggestions? Oh, yeah. sorry. It's, were you still going? Oh yeah. Any suggestions to respond to either positive or negative reviews? Yeah. Um, so I recommend, well, I honestly, I've never, I, I've, I've only used get five stars, which I think is now gather up uh, a long time ago and it was okay. Um, I don't think there's anything, anything wrong with it. I'm actually uh, developing software that is going to be live in the next maybe month or two. Um, that's specific for lawyers. Um, to generate software, it's called Review Judge, um, and we've got something at ReviewJudge.io. I can't remember what. Actually, it might just be a sales page. <laughs> um, but basically, um, 
what that software does is it automate it automates the review generation process and it actually gives out the questions that will lead to better reviews and not only that but also makes you rank higher in google when you when you ask questions that when you get reviews that have categories and or keywords and uh you know local or re related terms to uh the practice area and to the location then you actually rank higher in the google maps a lot of people don't realize that so our software does that automatically it also does review screening um, and, uh, and, you know, helps you prevent negative reviews. And then if you get negative reviews, it also, um, has a, uh, proprietary system built in there that we actually use for all of our clients that allows us to get 75% of the negative reviews that our clients get. We actually get them removed. Um, and we have that built into the system also. So I'd recommend that, although it's not, um, it's not available yet. <laughs> so uh, gather up probably podium. I haven't, I haven't really tried any of, the, any of them recently, to be honest with you, but honestly, it's like something is better than nothing. You know, I mean, that, that, that's really the end of the day. That's what it comes down to is something is better than nothing. Um, so, so basically, um, when you're responding to reviews, one of the things that Google looks at in terms of, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of ranking factors, right? But one of the things that Google looks at in terms of a ranking factor is how many unresponded reviews you have. And then more importantly, how many negative reviews you have that have been left unresponded. So whenever you get a negative review, you always, always, always want to want to leave a response. Um, now, the response to the negative review should you got to use some customer service and, you know, so here's what you have to remember, right? It's very easy to want to call the person an idiot and, you know, no, you're lying and all this type of stuff. You know, I mean, like it's, it's very easy to want to do that. And in a lot of cases, um, it's probably warranted. But what you have to remember is that whatever you write in a public forum is like, yeah, it might feel great to like vent at about the, about the reviewer. But what's more important is that that review is not going to go away unless you use some sort of, unless you're able to get it removed, which I can help you with that. But unless you're, unless you can't get it removed, that review is always going to be there. So the impact that that review is going to have is going to be based on how you handle and how you respond to the review. So how you respond to the review is very, very important. I actually, I actually did this today. I had a client who, uh, who, who, who somebody, somebody wrote a review and they responded to it and they sent me the response to that. Let me know what I, what I think. And the first line was basically, you're lying about everything that you said, right? And it's, they, they probably were. They probably were lying. But the reality is, is that you have to be much more careful than that. Because if you, you, know, if you come at it too aggressive, you're going to look guilty, right? So what I always say is I always say you should start review. When you respond to a negative review, you should say something like, you know, thank you so much for your feedback. We take all feedback, both positive and negative, very seriously. Based on your feedback, uh, you know, we're, you know, it, it's clear that there's been some miscommunication that left you unhappy. And, you know, we want to let you know that customer service is a top priority. So, um, you know, obviously we cannot discuss specifics of a case in a public forum like this, but we would love to uh, resolve this matter in an amicable way because it's clearly a misunderstanding. Please give me a call at the office and I'll be happy to, you know, work something out with you. Right now here's a, we, we, and, and that's, I've actually got videos on this, um, about how to, how to handle, you know, like with specific examples. Um, if you go to my YouTube channel, but something like that is going to be much better because it shows other people that, you know, you're willing to reach out and that you're willing to work something out. Now, here's another thing is that, uh, I've, I've been using those types of reviews for years and I don't know of a single instance where the reviewer has ever actually reached out and, and done anything. But at the end of the day, you know, you, you're going to look way better than if you just go on there and call the person an idiot and everything. Now, here's the other thing. If they are, if they were never a client, this happens a lot of the time. Also, um, we have family law attorneys constantly who will get a good, a good, a good, uh, uh, you know, result for their client. And then the spouse or the, the opposing party <laughs> will go on and leave a negative review for the client. Um, a lot of times we can get those removed, but um, you know, we'll typically, we'll, we'll use kind of the same response, but we'll typically also say something like, you know, after further review, uh, we have no record of you ever being a client of our, of our firm or anything like that. Um, 
So I've also seen other attorneys that have uh, said uh, that this is the, you know, basically said something like, uh, this is the, um, the spouse of our client uh, after we, you know, got our client a really good result. So this actually can be looked at as a five-star review or something like that. It's cute and it's cheeky. It's also, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I recommend that. I think it's funny. Um, but I don't know that I would recommend that my clients do that. Um, but that's something else you could do also if you really wanted to, but, um, yeah. So, and then responding to positive reviews, you know, that that's pretty much however you want to just make sure you respond to everything. That's always really important though. Cause, uh, it's, I don't know how big of a ranking signal it is, but it's definitely some sort of signal. Um, uh, but definitely, definitely, definitely unresponded negative reviews is a huge ranking signal and that's something you can control. So you should definitely respond to them, but don't look like a jerk while you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's more for the people who are, who are looking at it and not for that person. Exactly. That review is going to be up for, I mean, potentially in the next five, 10 years. You know, you want to make sure that, I mean, thousands of people are going to see it. So yeah. you want to make sure that it's handled in a, a really good way. Awesome. Uh, and then he said it's, uh, he's glad, Jason's glad to be a beta tester for the program. Uh, oh, sweet. You're in, you're in review judge already. Oh, he's, he said, yeah. I don't know if you even want to ask a question about doing that or if he's already in. Okay, but, cool. Yeah, we're actually, so just so you know, everyone's, uh, I'm, we're expecting to be giving everyone user access this week. Google, basically, like Google wasn't accepting any reviews lately, um, but that went way further than just reviews because they basically, like we're, we're, we're using the Google API and they wouldn't even approve our access to the Google API. Not that they disapproved it, it's just they weren't even, it was just pending for like three, actually it might still be pending. I think we figured out a workaround because we just decided we didn't want to wait anymore. Nice. And that was, he had actually had one more uh, thing here. Uh, how can you obtain a higher domain authority for citations? Uh, competitors rank 17th and he's only 14. Domain authority. Um, well, domain authority is not all about citations. It's all about how many, it's about, it's about how many sites link to you and what's the quality of those sites. Um, so really the, one of the best ways is just get more links. Um, but you know, it's not like, it's, you know, you've got to get really high quality links. That's, that's the whole thing. And, um, so you can go for like, uh, websites that are like, I mean, honestly, I think local, local, uh, uh directories are good. Um, good ones would also be local, actual local directories, like your local bar association, local chambers of commerce. Those, those kind of do, do two things. One, it's a good citation. So it, it boosts your prominence in Google, uh, for Google, my business. But then it's also going to go ahead and boost your domain authority. Now, here's the thing I want you to remember. Domain authority is not a real thing. It's not an official number by Google. It's just basically something that um, uh, Moz came up with. So, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, Ahrefs has their score. Majestic has their score. Um, so you have to take all those numbers with, with a grain of salt, really. Um, but 14 to 17 is not that not that drastic of a, of a change. Um, you know, another thing that you can do, that actually works really well is uh, you can do the PSA style marketing that I talked about before. And then you tie that into an outreach, uh, tie that into outreach for local reporters. And basically you send that PSA style content to local reporters as well. And then what ends up happening is the local reporters will start featuring you and then you'll start getting links from news organizations. Uh, we had a client that actually just got uh, a link from the NBC News affiliate in Miami. She's a Miami personal injury attorney. And they actually linked, I believe they actually linked using the anchor text Miami personal injury attorney to her, her homepage, which is like, I mean, that's a huge win. So that worked really well. So it was basically taking the PSA and that's literally what she did. She stacked the PSA style approach with reaching out to reporters and basically saying, hey, did you know this? You should look at this. <laughs> you know? And uh, she got featured. Yeah, that's awesome. Um so that was Jason Lutsky. Uh, do we have a uh, book for him? All right. He has not got one. All right. The Dream 100 book. This is from Dana Derricks. Um, this is actually pretty cool. It, uh, it teaches you basically how to, uh, the Dream 100 is basically a concept where you figure out like who are the like top 100 people that you would like to have promote your business. Um, and it, it's really cool. It walks you through the entire step. So I, I read this. Uh, I read this on vacation last year when I was in Cancun and I was supposed to go again this year, but actually in like two weeks I was supposed to go and uh, my vacation got canceled, unfortunately. So this book is very depressing for me, <laughs> but it's a good book. It is. Yeah. Uh, 
All right, so next up we have Kurt asked a question. Um, is there an ideal link for doing YouTube videos to answer common questions? Yes, uh, the video should be as long as it needs to be without rambling. <laughs> I mean, like, honestly, it's, it's kind of like, you, you don't want to be boring. Um, so, like, YouTube says that the ideal length is like 10 to 15 minutes, but that's also YouTube trying to keep people on YouTube, right? Um, if you're talking about, uh, did he say practice area? He did not. Okay. If you're, you know, if you're a bankruptcy attorney or really, I mean, okay. IP law. So IP law. yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, I, I don't know. I, when I create videos, I don't ever look at the length. I basically just, I film the video and I say what I need to say. And as long as I'm providing really good value, then it's good. Um, my average video is probably anywhere from like four to five minutes. Um, I did a video yesterday that was like seven minutes and I would say most of my videos are four to five minutes. But again, I don't really look at, I don't really pay attention to the length. I mean, you know, you want to make sure you're not rambling. You want to make sure that you're not boring. You want to make sure you have good energy the entire time. And as long as that's good, then, then, then just let it fly. You know? Um, now here's the thing. If you combine multiple topics into a single video, then it's probably going to be long. So I don't usually combine multiple topics into a single video unless they're extremely related. Yesterday, actually, I filmed a video and this is a video that's going to be running as an ad soon. Um, uh, but um, what it does, it, it talks about how to make your, your pictures that you use in ads, how to make them kind of pop a little bit more, right? So basically, the first thing I do is I demonstrate on my phone how I use the filters that are actually built into the iPhone to kind of uh, make the, the pictures um, pop a little bit more. And then I go, and then, you know, if you want to take it even further, then you can use this other cool app called Pixel Loop. And then I demonstrate how Pixel Loop works. Um, so those two are kind of related. Honestly, I really could do a video just, I could do a video separate for each one, but I didn't. But um, like, for example, like, like, like this Q&A is a perfect example. There's all, kind, you know, basically this Q&A is a series of question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. I would never post this entire video as is just on Facebook. But what I will do and what we always do is we'll take this and every single video will get chopped up. The question and the answer and there's one video. And then the next question and answer, there's another video. And then the next question and answer, there's another video. And each one of these question and answer segments is probably about four to five minutes long. And, um, and then you get a lot of content out of it that way. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's basically just long enough to, to, to provide the answer, to provide really good value. Don't get, don't get rambly. Don't get too into the weeds. Um, and, and that's really the answer. You know, don't, I don't look at the clock. I just, I just make sure it's valuable. Awesome. And that was Kurt. Want to do a book? Yeah, book. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to give this one. <laughs> All right. So this one, uh, this one's really interesting. It's uh, Lost and Founder by Rand Fishkin. Uh, it's basically, uh, it's actually a really interesting book, even if you're not really into like startups and stuff. Um, it's really interesting about how these startups work and how like venture capitalist firms work and how they basically just completely like bleed startups dry. So Lost and Founder, it's a good book. Awesome. Okay, so next up, we've got a question from Ralph. Uh, this is a longer question. So, uh, he says he's not an attorney, he's a certified financial planner, but he has a similar market as elder law attorneys. Medicaid, planning for elders who need long-term care at home, assisted living and nursing homes, also a VA accredited claims agent. He wants to offer his services to estate planning attorneys uh, and show them Medicaid planning business so they can increase their income. Um, they do the legal part, he does everything else. What are your suggestions for getting those type of clients? Uh, so once again, it's try to figure out what are the problems that estate planning attorneys have that where they bring you into the fold, right? So most estate planning attorneys can probably handle a basic estate by themselves without having to get a financial planner involved, right? So what are the most common issues and the most common times? What are, when do you get brought into the fold, right? And then what you want to do is you want to start creating videos that answer those, that, that basically, you know, talk about those types of problems and uh, provide a solution to it. And um, one of the best things you can do, I haven't talked about this yet, is Hook Story Offer. Hook Story Offer is the easiest way to do any video. And it's, it's so super simple, right? So 
Um, trying to think what a reason then. Like, so, so let's say like an estate planning attorney needs help. Uh, what's a reason that an estate planning attorney, maybe it's like a, uh, I don't know. They have an estate clients. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but like, let's say they have an estate clients and that's why they would need to bring in a, or, or sorry, they have like, uh, they have a house here and then they have property that's located out of state. So, um, and maybe that's not something that's an issue, but just as an example, this is what I would say. So I say, uh, Hey, estate planning attorneys, um, or, you know, did you know that when a, when you're, when you're working on a trust on a, with a, and, and the client has uh, an estate, you know, a property on a state, there are three taxes that typically that, that most estate planning attorneys miss that cost the client thousands of dollars. Um, and, you know, but, but, but it's really easy to avoid them. So, so that's kind of your hook, right? You want to have some sort of hook that addresses the problem and addresses, you know, kind of agitates the, the pain. Um, and that might not be a problem, but you got to figure out what, what's the problem, right? Um, and by the way, on the video, I would do the exact same thing. I mean, look at what I do. I do, hey, lawyers, you know, so do some sort of like, hey, estate planning attorneys or something like that just to get their attention. Um, and then you want to tell a story. So the story is we had a, uh, you know, I was working with an estate planning attorney and they had a client who had a house in California and also in New York. And the estate planning attorney, uh, you know, thought they had their estate in order. They did all this type of stuff. But then the husband unfortunately passed away. And when he passed away, California came knocking on the door and they said, hey, you know what? Because the estate is set up in this particular way, you now have to pay, uh, you know, these fines and all the, or not fines, but you, you not, they now have to pay all these, all these different expenses. Well, the spouse, the, you know, the widow now is, was so upset that she got, she, she actually went on the estate. She was so mad at the estate planning attorney. Um, she went on and she, uh, left him a bad review and did all that type of stuff. So I actually don't want to say it's a client. You want to just tell a story about somebody, but basically you tell a story about somebody that this happened to. And the reason you want to tell a story is because stories are much better and people relate to stories much better than just like if you were just to, to shoot off some, some statistics, you know? Um, so if you tell the story about the person who they, they, they were impacted by this tax um, that, their estate planning attorney missed. And then the estate planning attorney ultimately suffered because the person was mad and they went to their country club and they told everybody about the estate plan and he lost all kinds of business and um, they left him a bad Google review and all that type of stuff. Um, but if you would have just done these two things, it wouldn't have been a problem. It would have been fine. And you know, it would have been all taken care of. So that's the story, right? And then the hook is now, if you have a client, if you're an estate planning attorney and you have a client and you're dealing with some complicated issues like out of state property and things like that, then, sh then uh, you know, click the link included with this video and I'd be happy to advise you and help you or, you know, whatever your offer is, you know? And uh, that's a strategy that works really well. And what I would do is I would, once again, I'd sit down and I'd write down a list of every single problem that estate planning attorneys have that they need to uh, involve a certified financial planner. Um, and think about what stories do you have or stories do you know that could be used to basically illustrate that problem and then record videos and run them as ads to estate planning attorneys. And I mean, I, I know for a fact that you can target estate planning attorneys on, on, uh, on, on Facebook. I do it all the time. So that's, that's, that's exactly what I would do. Okay. Awesome. That was uh, Ralph Robbins. So yeah. All right, uh, we're gonna do shoe dog. So this is, uh, it's, uh, the, it was written by the, the guy who started uh, Nike. It's really good. Yeah, that's a good one. Bill Knight, have you read that? Really good. Uh, yeah, actually I listened to the audio book, but yeah, it's good. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so next up we've got another one from Leonard. Uh, he was just asking, what are your thoughts on both ghost writers and white label books? Um, ghost right well, so, <laughs> Uh, using them for a book. Yeah. Um, what I would, what I think is a better, a better way to do it, um, is create videos and create content and stuff like that, and then have a writer transcribe them and turn them into a book and just kind of fill in the blanks rather than having somebody who, cause, cause that way it is your words. Um, and rather than having somebody who really knows nothing about what you do, trying to write a book as you, it's better to do it as your words. I mean, that's, I mean, truthfully, that's how I created my book. Um, 
I don't know who has my book. If you don't have my book, go to freebookforlawyers.com um, and you can get my book. But basically what we did is I hired a writer and uh, we, we literally took hundreds of videos, transcribed them and put them in an order that made sense. Apparently, apparently I've actually spoken my entire book and didn't even realize it. Um, but basically, uh, you know, we did all that and then we had all the pieces together. That way, you know, he had all the information, he had my words, how I say things. And then we just kind of filled in some of the blanks and it came together really, really well. That's the easiest way to do it. And it's the best way to do it because it's actually your words. It's not someone else speaking as you. And the problem is if, if somebody else writes a book for you and speaks as you, you're going to spend so much time editing it that you might as well record videos and, and transcribe the whole thing anyway, you know, and the difference is going to be is that if it takes you, you know, 20 hours or 30 hours worth of time, in one scenario, you only have a book. In the other scenario, you've got, you know, 200 videos or, you know, 75 videos, however many videos it is, plus a book, you know? So that's how I would do it. Um, and if you, if you need the guy who did mine, I can give you his information. He was really good. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, cool. Uh, and that was uh, Leonard. So we already got a book for him. Right. So uh, next up, we've got Dan. He asked a question, how long are your email sequences? for a particular lead magnet before they go into your general email list? Um, I don't think we have. Well, okay, so my webinar, yeah, it depends. So the only email sequence I have, I think, is for the webinar, right? Is that right, Chase? Right. Chase actually, this is actually probably a better question for Chase because <laughs> Chase actually runs my email list. Um, but I think it's, I think the only one we actually have an organized sequence for is the webinar, right? Right. The webinar, and then we, we break them up into different uh, classifications based on if they showed up, didn't show, or they, they watched it, saw the offer, and didn't book a call. So that's our longest sequence because someone's you know, put in the time and watched everything, uh, and it gives them a lot of value, answers a lot, of, um, a lot of the objections in that one. And I think that's about 15 emails um, before they go into the general. The other two are about five emails each. Yeah. And if, I mean, cause we figure if, if, if you signed up for the webinar, you watch the first, you watch the first five minutes of it. If you haven't watched, cause, cause basically we, we, our goal with the entire thing is like, we've got, we, we, the main thing that we're trying to, you know, the main thing that I'm doing is, is advertising my, my marketing, my coaching program. Right. So what I do is the way that I do it is I, the, the basic structure is cold ad or warm ad. Um, uh, you know, add to landing page to webinar to phone call, right? So that's, that's basically what we're trying to do. Um, but we have different phases. Like every phase is just trying to get them to the next phase. So there's, um, you know, they went to the, they, they read, you know, our first goal is to get them to register for the webinar, right? And then the next goal is to get them to show up to the webinar. So if they register for the webinar, but they don't actually show up to the webinar, um, then, we have an entire email sequence that is dedicated just to getting them to show up to the webinar. And that's basically showing up to the webinar means that they watch the first five seconds of the webinar, right? Now, if they watch the, once they watch the first five seconds, our goal is to get them to stick to the five minute mark. If they don't stick to the five minute mark, then we have an entire email sequence that actually fires off that tries to get them to go back to the webinar and watch it. Once they've hit the five minute mark, our goal is to get them to see the book a call offer, right? We try to get them to stick around, watch the rest of the webinar, and then get to the point where I say, hey, if you're interested, book a call. So if they, have, if, they, if they saw the webinar, but they didn't book a call, then we have an entire email sequence that gets them to try to go back and watch the rest of the webinar. If they see the book a call offer, but they don't book a call, then we have another entire email sequence that goes out and, uh, and, and tries to get them to, uh, to, to book the call. So theoretically you could be in my email sequences and and when when you when you if 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 you're in an email sequence it'll and and you complete one goal but not another it'll stop the current sequence that you're in and it'll start another one so you could probably theoretically be in an email sequence of mine if you timed it right for like a month i think <laughs> before you actually end up on my general email list um but that's the only one we do i think the longest one like chase says 15 days 
Um, but most everyone just gets dumped into the, the, the general. I don't, I don't do a follow-up or, or pre-email. I, yeah, I don't do follow-up for people that just hit the um, cheat sheet or I think we might have one or two for the book, like an abandoned cart sequence for the book. Mm-hmm. But um, I found that these just don't, they don't work very well. And I, what works better is getting people right into the, uh, uh, the, the general email sequence and provide value without, without selling things. Because that's, that's really been the secret of, of, of my marketing is I provide value without selling anything. So if you go to my book page and you answer your information and then you leave, but then you, and that's like the first interaction you've ever had with me. And then you just get 20 sales emails about buy my book. That's not, that's not my message really. You know I mean? It's, it's, you know, but yeah, I might sell a couple of books here or there, but I'm more likely to sell them a book later if they've watched 25 of my videos and they think they're all valuable and they say, okay, now I want to read his book because it's really, because you know, the, the content that he put out is really good. So that's, that's kind of my thought on that. Yeah. And the general email sequence is uh, almost two years long now. So (laughs) So it's pretty, yeah, we're over, we gotta be over two years, aren't we? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So if I, if I die today, you won't know for two years. Uh, so that was Dan Wynn on that question. Oh, we need a book. Yeah. All right. We're getting to the bottom here, actually. All okay. right. Uh, Bad Blood. Have you, uh, this, this book's really cool. Oh, it's, yeah. um, did you read this? Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's about the, the, the girl that founded Theranos, which was like a giant scam. Um, but it was, it was, it's, a really, it's a really interesting book. I read that on vacation, too. Vacation. Uh, so next up, we've got Anonymous. So Anonymous, I'm going to give a book out here. Uh, but they said, uh, what is your view on direct mail and the mm-hmm. best way to execute it? Uh, any disruptive type ideas? Yeah, lumpy, lumpy objects. I've been, uh, I've been uh, talking about lumpy mail for two years now. Um, direct mail is, uh, I think it's good if you do it right. If you do it wrong, then it's, it doesn't work. I mean, it's like everything. <laughs> if you do it well, it works. So here's the best way to do direct mail. Um, and the way that I discovered this, the way that I came up with this is a couple, uh, a couple years ago, my accountant forgot to file our California tax return. Um, actually for three years in a row, he didn't file our California tax return. And our address is like a PO box, um, for, for, for what, for the, for this particular business. So, um, I, you know, we didn't, I didn't, I don't ever check it. So I, I went there and I saw all these, uh, attorney letters that were like, we can help you with your tax lien and help, help get your, uh, your tax lien removed and all that type of stuff. Um, but it was the same letter. Every single thing was literally just a white envelope with a different law firm's name. And, you know, I mean, it, nothing was different, right? Um, so I opened one and I saw it and I kind of got the, the general idea of what was going on. And I threw the rest away because I knew it was the same thing, you know, but I, nothing made me open that one. I just, it was luck of the draw that I even opened that one. And then the rest of them got thrown away. In that, same, uh, in that same mail delivery, there was a package from um, Vistaprint. And, or maybe it wasn't Vistaprint, 4imprint. It was 4imprint.com. That's what it is. And there was a pen in there. And so I, I got this thing and there was a, a package that clearly had something inside of it that I didn't know what it was. Um, so I opened that package and everything else got thrown away. But that package got opened. So I was thinking, well, you know, if, um, if, if one of these attorneys would have just put something in there to make me curious about what it is, I would have opened it because that's the ch- most challenging part of direct mail is getting it opened. You know, I mean, like most people stand over their trash can while they're going through their mail and just throwing crap away, you know? So, um, so that's the biggest thing that I would do is I would put something in there to make it lumpy. Um, and, and make that, I mean, cause like curious, it's the same thing for an email. If you use a, a, an email subject that is boring and doesn't, uh, doesn't, it doesn't, uh, cause any curiosity, they're not going to open. It's the same thing as a letter, you know? So, um, if you put something inside of it, that is, makes them, you know, curious what's inside. So I always think that like I, the, the cheapest thing that I've found is like green army men. Um, but you can, I mean, you can go on Amazon, you can get all kinds of stuff or actually even like Oriental trading or something, you know, like there's, there's a little plastic green army, man. They're really light. They're really cheap. You can get a bag of probably like 200 of them for like 10 bucks, you know? Um, now it might cost, it might cost you more in postage to send these. However, 
um, I would bet any amount of money that your ROI will be ridiculously higher and it won't matter how much more it costs because you're actually getting, you're actually making much more money because you're getting people to actually open your, your letters. So that's, that's my biggest thing is lumpy mail because everyone's, you, I mean, really like, it's like, just look at what everyone else is doing and just do the opposite. And that's, that's typically the answer to, <laughs> it's usually the answer to most, most, uh, most marketing problems, but yeah, lumpy mail is my suggestion. Awesome. Yeah. Our friend, uh, Jeff Goldtrap says he loves direct mail. He's using the lumpy items, uh, no data yet, but I'll let you know how it turns out. And he's also working on developing a service to do direct mail for lawyers. For yeah. Let, let me, let me know how the lumpy mail works for you, Jeff. Cause I know we've been talking about that for a while. I, I didn't know that you'd started it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. He said no data yet. So he must've just started it. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, up next, we've got Myron with a question. Um, he says, any advice for lawyers in more niche corporate areas? The advice provided seems to be B2C versus B2B. My practice is focused more on marketing towards corporations, typically sophisticated organization. Sophisticated, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, well, here, here's the thing. Like, the, the, the secret is, is that most, everything's B2C because if you, if you, if you target people, like that, that's the biggest thing is target, you know, at the end of the day, like it's, it's a company that runs it, but at the same time is all it's, it's people that are seeing the ads. You know, the, the company is not the one making the decision. A representative of the company is making the decision. And um, the biggest thing that you can do is figure out what are the most common issues that those people have and how can you solve them? You know, how can, how can you provide value and how can you talk about things that, that really impact them, you know? So you could do it on LinkedIn. I think, um, LinkedIn might work really well, especially since you can kind of target those like C-suite employees or C-level employees, whatever they're called. Um, but still everyone's still on Facebook. I mean, <laughs> if they're, you know, regardless of where they work, they're still on Facebook, you know, and, and typically what you can do is you can start targeting people that um, you, you can start targeting people using a strategy that basically just kind of narrows people down, right? So let me see if I can bring up a whiteboard here uh, and draw this out on a second. Let me see. Hold on. I haven't tried this yet. Share screen. No, I don't want to share my screen. Uh, upgrade. It's not going to allow me to do it. Okay. Let me see if I can draw this on a notepad. I've got a notepad here. So let me see if I can draw this really quickly. All right. So basically, uh, hold on a second. Of course, I grabbed the pen that doesn't work. There we go. All right. I'm going to just draw this and then this will make sense. Okay. So you got to kind of look at it as like a bullseye, right? <clears throat> so let's see if this is going to make sense. So what I do, and actually I, I created a video that talked about this a little while ago. Um, and what you do is you create a video that is probably four to five minutes long that addresses a concern that only those, only the, your ideal customers are going to have. Right. And you show that to a wide audience. Okay. So this outer circle here is the wider audience. And basically what that means is that you're going to show it. To, and like this, this right here, this small circle is the actual type of people that you're trying to target. Right. So, but, to get them, you need to show it to a wider audience. So what you do is you create a video that solves a problem that only your ideal clients have and only they would care about, right? And you run this video on Facebook as a video ad. And you want to target people that have business interests. And you can do, you know, and, and you're going to have to uh, do some really good research. And I've actually got some videos about how to do target, Facebook targeting, right? But you could target, like if I'm trying to target uh, uh business, uh, you know, like, like, like C-suite people. I think about like, what are the, what, what are the books that they read? Who are the influencers that they follow? What are the magazines that they read? What are the websites they go to? What are the newspapers that they read? What are the, um, you know, brands that they like all those types of things. And you can target all those interests and you're going to miss a lot. You're going to hit a, an audience that's this big when you're really just targeting these people. Right. But what you want to do is you want to go into Facebook and you're going to run ads and you're going to create a custom audience of people that watch 25% of that first video, right? Then you're going to create a second video. 
And that second video is going to be another problem, another video that solves a problem that only these types of people would have. And it provides really good value. And then you're going to create another, uh, and, and basically what you're going to do is you're going to show that video to only the people that watch 25% of video one. So now that circle is starting to shrink and now you're kind of getting closer to them because if it's a, if it's a topic that only they care about and the video is four to five minutes long, that means that they will have had to watch a video for at least one, one minute to one minute, 15 seconds on Facebook or social media. That is a eternity. They're not going to watch that video unless they're interested. Um, now there's going to be some people that are going to scroll past and the video is going to start and they're going to get up because their phone rings or whatever. And that's why the circle is a little bigger, right? So you've got the first video that goes wide. Then you got your second video. That's going to 20 people that watch 25% of the first video. So now the second video, you're going to create another custom audience and you're going to uh, make sure that you're capturing people that watch 25% of that video. And then you're going to show that video or you're going to create a third video. You're going to show that third video to people that watch 25% of the second video. And that's going to be this audience right here. And if you wanted to, you could keep doing that and keep doing it until you get really, really granular because nobody's going to be watching these videos. Like you go really wide and you cast a wide net and then you, you take the people that raise their hand and say, I have this problem, I'm this type of person, and then you show them another video. And then by the time you got to this point, you've got people who have watched 25% of two videos that are about a specific problem that only your ideal clients care about. And that's how you do it. That's, that's the way that I would do it. I actually did that. Um, I was trying for a while, uh, about two years ago, um, I opened a brewery. I actually still own a brewery. Um, and I, I wanted to start doing some marketing for breweries because, um, I don't know, I just thought it'd be fun to be a change of pace from, from doing stuff for lawyers. So I literally, the, the problem is there's no, you can't target brewery owners. The only thing you can do is target beer interests, right? So what I did is I targeted people who have all these beer interests, but I only created content that was, that was dealing with problems that people who own breweries have. And I did, I literally did that exact same thing. I can even show you the videos at, at some point if you, if you want to see them. But the first video went to a really wide audience and it was a really wide group of people that, you know, probably most of whom do not own breweries and do not work in breweries and, and they're not interested in that. They just like drinking beer. But there was a decent number of people that raised their hand and said, hey, I'm a brewery owner. I have this problem. So then I showed them the second video. And then, you know, I got fewer, uh, I, I got fewer people, but then I, I was able to show those people a third video and we ended up booking like, I don't know, like 30 consultations in like a week. And um, it worked really, really well. The problem that we ran into is that brewery owners are kind of like artists uh, in the sense that um, I found them to be not very responsible <laughs> and not very good at business. Uh, so I kind, of, uh, I kind of decided that I was going to uh, use it as a good learning experience and, uh, and, and stick with lawyers for a while. But that's how you do it. And, and it's, you know, it works for, I mean, it's like anything. If you want to get car accident cases, you can use the exact same strategy. Um, if you want, you know, any, any, anything you want to do, you can use that same strategy. Yeah, that's a good point. Like you said, uh, maybe B to B, but, uh, at some point you're reaching a person and that person is probably on. That's the whole so. thing. It's all, it's all people like B to yeah. B, B to C. It doesn't matter. You're targeting people at the same, at the end of the day. And that's, that's the same thing. Like, you know, it's at the end of the day, you're also targeting the same people that everyone else is targeting. You know, it's like, you're, you're a lawyer. Yes. But you're also targeting the same people that Outback Steakhouse is targeting or Nike is targeting, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's people that you're targeting. And that's, that's, that's what a lot of people kind of forget, I think. Yeah. And that was uh, Myron. Uh, so we have not given him a book. Oh, sweet. I'm reaching the bottom of the barrel here. <laughs> and Myron, if you want to drop us your address in the chat, uh, we can go ahead and send that out. All right. Go ahead. Uh, mass persuasion method. Sure. So, cool. Uh, mass persuasion method. I don't have a story to go along with that. <laughs> and if anyone uh, has joined us late, uh, has any questions, just go ahead and put them in the Q and A. Um, we'll get to them. So up next, we got another question from Randall. And actually, Randall asked one last week, and we had got his. Oh, is he the one we were looking for his address? Yeah. So we do have a book for you. I believe it was four. Um, so yeah, so if you have your, your information, Randall, 
By the way, anybody that I don't know how many people got the got a books from last week. Um, my wife. So I bought I bought, I bought poly mailers, and my wife my wife owns a business also, and the ones that I like are the ones that I ordered. She liked more for her business, so uh, I didn't realize this, but she actually because I just gave her the books and the addresses to ship, um, and she shipped them out in like pink cat poly mailers. So <laughs> the, po the 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 packaging that you get these books in is going to be a little weird. <laughs> Um, so yeah, he had a question about reviews. He says he's at the point where he's a criminal defense lawyer. He's got about 25 reviews, all good, five star. Uh, is that enough, uh, in your opinion, to make an impact or is there a certain number to strive for? Uh, yes. Okay. So no, it's not enough. It's never enough. Um, because there's a, okay. So, so what we have found, here's what you need to strive for. Um, you need to strive for having the most number of reviews in your market because what we have found is that being in the Google three pack is the best way to make the phone ring. However, being in the Google three pack and having the most reviews is the best way to make the phone ring absolutely off the hook. Um, we have a client, actually we had a client, they're not a client anymore. Um, this was several years ago. They were a, they're, they're a bankruptcy attorney in Chicago. And they were ranking very, very well for some very, very competitive keywords. You know, really any keyword that you would want uh, to appear for. Chicago bankruptcy attorney, uh, chapter seven, chapter 13, chapter 11, foreclosure, you know, short sale, all, all, the, all the, the basic, all the usual suspects, as they say. Um, and they were in the maps, but they were just not getting a ton of phone calls. Uh, and, you know, some weeks would be good, some weeks would be slow. Uh, but it was weird because they were, there just wasn't a lot of call volume. So we looked at the, the Google Maps. We started looking at things and it just clicked to me. For some reason, I, I realized this and I never noticed it before. They only had five reviews and the other two attorneys that were in the Maps, one had 10 and one had 15. So I told them they need to go get 20 reviews because they need to have the highest number of reviews. And they actually did it. They listened to me and luckily they did because we have this case study now. Um, and then next week, so, so they actually did it. I, I talked to them on like a Thursday or a Friday. Uh, they did it over the weekend. By, so by Monday, they had 25 reviews. And that week was the busiest week in the history of their law firm. And it just, it just stayed busy like that. Um, so that told me <laughs> definitively that the number one uh, factor of getting, uh, of getting phone calls when you're in the maps is not your placement. Because they weren't number one in the maps. They were like either number two or number three but they had the most reviews. So you have to remember when someone searches for uh, your law firm, if they knew who you were, they would search for you by name. They wouldn't search um, criminal defense attorney. You know, they would search, uh, uh, you know, they would search by your name. So the only thing they can do is categorize you by what other people are saying because they have no other way unless they just like your name, but that's usually not enough to get somebody to call you. So they're going to look at what is the, what is the star rating, right? And then a lot of times there's going to be lots of law firms that have the same star rating. So they can't really go by that. So now they have to look at, um, okay, well, who has the most reviews? And that's, that, that usually wins. Um, we've seen it over and over and over and over again. So the, the challenge is, so your first step is you need to have the most, the most reviews, the highest number of reviews. And then you need to keep getting more reviews because what's going to happen is, your, your competition is also getting reviews. So eventually they're going to have more reviews than you if, if, if you if you get complacent and you don't want to get complacent. You want to keep getting reviews, keep getting reviews. It should be, it, it should, it should be considered a, an essential part of your growth as a law firm is getting as many reviews consistently as possible. Awesome. Yeah, and Randall uh, gave us his address. So uh, that's great. Got got, yeah, we got it. So uh, he's got one more question. Um, does a YouTube video help, help one's website ranking if you add them? Like, do you have more videos? Is that better for your website? How does one YouTube video on your website help your ranking versus well, a review? I don't know if it's going to help it directly, but I don't know. So we had a theory a little while ago, a couple years ago, that because we used to use Vimeo videos on our, our client websites because they look so much better. Um, but we switched over to YouTube because Google owns YouTube. So we had this theory that Google probably is going to reward you if you use their products because that's, that's just what they do. They, did, they, they usually will, will reward you for using their, their own products. 
Um, so I don't know if they do or not, but we still use YouTube for that reason. I don't think it looks as good as Vimeo. Um, but I, I don't know. We didn't see a direct ranking, but what does give a ranking boost is uh, user engagement. So when someone goes to your website and they immediately bounce back, meaning they go to your website and then they click the back button, go back to the search engine, that, that actually, that will hurt your ranking. Um, but when they go to your website and they stick around for a while and they watch a video for maybe, you know, two minutes and then they, they have all this engagement stuff, that will help you because it's a, it's a more engaged website. So it's not necessarily that having the video there will improve your website, but it will increase user engagement, which improves your website, if that makes sense. So I recommend having videos, relevant videos, you know, and, and the reality is, is that some people like reading and some people like watching videos. I'm the type of person I would much rather watch a video than, than read. So, you know, if you have videos, it, it helps, it helps both, both sides of the equation. You know, you can, if you have web, website content and videos, then you're, you're, you're capturing everyone. So I think that that's, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of video. I think it's good. Yeah. So he had put in his question, um, ranking, you know, what helps ranking more a video or an answered review? That would be an answered review, but that would be for Google My Business, right? Well, right. I don't think it's, I don't think it's either or, I mean, I, you know, do both. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's like, you know, you, you want to, you want to, th there's so many things that are out of your control. And the reason I say they're out of your control, cause like you can't, com you can't, uh, you're not in control of what your competitors are doing. You're not in control of algorithm updates that Google's making. You're not in control of, of, you know, really you're not in control of which websites link to you. So anything that you can control, you should at least do your best to check that box. So you could, you can absolutely control if you answer reviews, you know? So it's, it's just, you know, it's, there's no excuse not to do it. And then same thing with putting video on your website. I mean, you can control creating video and, and putting it on. So you might as well do it. Yep. But I don't think it's like one is going to be better than the other. I think it's just kind of like, it's an ecosystem. Everything kind of affects everything. Okay, great. And uh, Dan's got another question. Uh, what are some of the ways to eliminate or reduce cost per acquisition cost uh, when using ads for lawyers? Uh, example, free plus shipping offers. Mm -hmm. uh, free plus shipping offers are always good. Um, what, what practice area? Yeah, Dan, what, what practice area are you in? Well, and you know, another way to get another way to uh, reduce acquisition costs is to have them be warm leads um, rather than, than cold. Um, you know, so like if you run video view ads and you can, you can create video view ads that people are uh, consuming and watching. And then after that, you remarket to them with more content then that's those remarketing ads are going to be a lot cheaper and they're going to be more effective because people have already seen you. It's a lot easier to get someone that, that, already knows and likes and trusts you to buy than it is to get a cold, a cold person to buy. Um, and then yeah, free plus shipping offers are really good. PSA marketing is great because it's completely free, you know? So you can do the PSA marketing that I talked about at the beginning of this. And you know, when you, when you do that, and then you also do the news reporter thing, um, that's setting you up to, to really have success. And all that stuff is completely free. Like there are lots of ways that you can market your law firm without spending any money at all. Um, and then your, 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 your CPA is zero. Yeah. And he, Dan said he's in trademarks and business formation. So. Okay. So what I would do then is I would create a core. I mean, this is, this is what I did. Uh, I've got, I've got a couple USB thumb drives. Um, I've got a Google, my business course. It's like a 25 part video series um, that teaches you how to rank in the Google maps. Um, I think you can get it at heylawyers.com. I've also got a Facebook, uh, a Facebook, for a free Facebook course where it's, uh, I don't know, it's like 13 videos that show you how to run Facebook ads for, for law firms. I actually probably need to update it. Um, but, you know, it's free plus shipping. So uh, that one, I don't even know what the URL is for that one. If you can put that one in the chat, if people want to see it, um, Chase. But um, yeah, so, so, now, you've really got to understand the, the psychology of funnels also. Uh, so if I'm a trademark attorney, what I would probably do is I would create a course. And when I say course, 
all you have to do is record videos talking about stuff that you know, right? So like you could create a course that's like, you know, uh, uh, the, the complete guide to uh, protecting your intellectual property and making sure that nobody steals your ideas and your business and you know, whatever, right? Um, and you say, this is completely free. I'm just going to send it to you using a free plus shipping. I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> send it to you using a free plus shipping. You say, I'm going to send it to you on this USB card. Um, all that I ask is that you just help me cover the shipping. And just watch the, watch the video that I, did, that I do on those, on those pages. Um, and really, you can just follow the format and just replace with your offer, right? So, um, so, so, so what you do is uh, you sell it for... I think I sell it for nine dollars and ninety seven cents, uh, and I, you know, it's basically you help me cover the shipping, and I'll send it to you for free. The reality is, is that it only costs me. I think the USB drives. I get ones that are flat, that are like the size of a credit card. That I get them on Amazon. I pay like I think like two dollars and fifty cents per drive, um, and then I also ship them. And 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 because of that, you can ship it in a flat envelope. Um, like a letter. So it only costs you like 89 cents. And then I have like a bubble mailer that I use. So all in, I think I'm like $4, right? So that means that I'm, I'm making, or I'm making $5 for each one that I sell, but I'm not really making that. What I'm doing is I'm, um, that, that, that's what, that's, that's money that I'm putting towards advertising, but it costs me typically more than, than, um, Actually, I don't even run, that, run ads for them anymore, but it used to cost me like $25 or $30 to actually sell one of those. But what you do is you, you add things, you figure out like what are things that are going to allow, them, allow, allow it to be easier for them, faster for them, or better for them, right? So the first thing that I always do is I always do an order bump and I want all of these extra things to be digital deliveries because the digital delivery doesn't cost, it literally costs me nothing. Um, you're just paying for your brain. And that's also why the course is really good because the course, like if I give you a 25 part video that or 25 part video series, I think it's like, it's like four hours long or something like that, that actually teaches you step-by-step -step how to rank in the Google maps. That's worth a ton of money. That's worth so much more than $9 and 97 cents, but it doesn't cost me anything. It's literally just my brain, you know, and my time to put it together one time. So, um, you can do the same type of thing. Just create a course you know, that, 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 that gives a lot of information. Um, at the bottom of my course, like every single slide, I think it says, want me to do this for you, you know, go to this page and, and, you know, apply to work for us or, or work with us or whatever. Um, you know, so I definitely get clients that way. Um, but then, you know, when you think about the upsells, cause the sales funnel is, is basically where it's like, it's like, do you want fries with that? Right. So when McDonald's sells a hamburger, they only, you know, when McDonald's sells a hamburger, they only make like 17 cents. But then when they say, would you like fries with that? Then they make a dollar 14 or whatever it is, right? So that's the idea is that you lose money on the first thing, but one, you generate a lead. Two, you generate goodwill. So hopefully that person, if they don't buy anything, for, if they don't hire you now, they'll, they'll hire you in the future. But then, you know, you can have what's called an order bump, which is basically like a, kind of a, it's like adding it to your order, right? So what I always do is cheat sheets. I say, okay, I'm going to give you the cheat sheets for, uh, you know, I'm going to give you the cheat sheets that are going to show you, um, you know, step-by-step -step how to actually do this, you know, and, and all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, and then the next one is like, how would you like me to build all your landing pages for you? And that's like $97, you know? Um, so that using all that, I'm able to r r increase the average order value because not everybody takes everything, but a decent percentage of people will take the order bumps. And now my advertising either breaks even or even is profitable, which is good. And because once you're, once you're actually profitable on your advertising, then you literally have no ad budget because if you sell a, if it takes you, let's say it takes you $30 to sell a USB drive that you're technically, you're actually going to sell for $9 and 97 cents. Um, but your average cart value is 45. Well, now you're making $15 every single time. So now you can just keep cranking the ad up and it doesn't really matter. I mean, honestly, even if you just break even, that's all you're trying to do because, you know, they say amateurs worry about the front end. Um, it's completely true because now you've got all these people that have basically paid you uh, to, to market to them, you know, and now you can market over and over and over again. And there's going to be some people that are going to take this information and they're going to never hire you. They're just going to do it themselves. And that's fine. They're, they were never going to be clients or they were going to be pain in the ass clients. So 
that's fine. Those people can take that stuff. But there's a lot of people that don't want to be their own trademark attorney, <laughs> you know, or don't want to handle their own copyrights. And those are the people that are going to hire you. And now they trust you already because they saw that you already demonstrated what, what, you know, what you do and everything. Um, I have a uh, part of, actually part of the Facebook guide is um, the self liquid. I have a course called self liquidations, self liquidation secrets, self liquidating secrets, which basically walks you through my entire free plus, free plus shipping funnel. Um, and it's I think it's, uh, if you do, if you go to the Facebook guide, it's like the third upsell or the second upsell on that. Um, and that actually teaches you exactly how to do it. Um, you know, in, in detail, it shows you how to fulfill. It shows you what are the, what are the, um, uh, you know, what are the products I order from Amazon? How do I do the shipping? How do I print the labels? All that type of stuff. Awesome. All right. And we had already given Dan a, a book okay, there. Cool. So, uh, yep. Next up, we've got anonymous. This is an interesting question. What is the best way to stay relevant and get your marketing out during coronavirus slash BLN movement when social media is so loud? Um, you've got to talk about, so, okay. So, uh, the way that you do it is you've got to talk about how to, uh, how to avoid loss, right? The fear of loss is a really, powerful motivator. Um, people are much more motivated by the fear of loss than they are the desire to gain something new. So during coronavirus, um, my marketing actually went through the roof. I actually, was, my, my marketing was extremely successful during coronavirus. And the reason why is because I shifted my message. Um, when everything's good, you know, the economy's good, people are making money, everybody's happy, nobody's scared about anything. Then you talk about the future. You, your message needs to be, okay, let's talk about how we're going to grow in the future. You know, so, um, you know, just, I mean, that's what it, it's what it is. Here's how you're going to grow, grow, grow the law firm of your dreams and, and, you know, start scaling up your law firm, right? When things get scary or bad, then, people are no longer thinking about the future. They're thinking, how do I hold on to what I have right now, right? So you have to change your messaging. Your messaging has to switch from here's how you grow to here's how you keep what you have. Here's how you don't lose any more, right? Because everybody's scared of losing their, you know, they're not getting clients. They're, they're afraid of losing their business, afraid of losing their income, which means they're not gonna be able to feed their family. They're gonna lose their house. They're gonna, they're worried about all those things. They're not thinking about, two years in the future growing their law firm, right? They're thinking about right now. So I shifted my messaging and, you know, you can do this in any market. You shift your messaging from talking about the future to here's a life preserver, basically. Here's how you keep what you have. Um, and when you do that, combined with the strategies that I've been talking about with the PSA marketing and helping people solve the problems that they have, then it gets really, really powerful and it works really, really well. So during times like this, then what you need to do is you just need to shift your, you shift your message. The same message that you were using back in, uh, you know, in 2019 or even really as recently as January and maybe the beginning of February is probably not going to work right now. Um, and, and now we're in this weird time where, I don't know, I mean, it's weird. A lot of people have kind of like gotten used to like the, the initial shock of coronavirus um, has, has kind of gotten everybody, everybody's kind of over it now, you know, um, people are kind of figuring out ways they, they've adapted. They're figuring out ways to start making money and start, uh, you know, pre, you know, basically getting clients for the most part. Um, there's still some people that are, are struggling with it, but, um, now we're in this weird hybrid where it's kind of like, it's not talking about the future, but people are kind of settled down a little bit. So I'm, um, it, it, I'm doing this kind of weird quasi thing right now, but that, that, that's typically the rule of thumb. It's basically, you know, you've got to either, um, talk about the future or talk about how to avoid losing what you have. Um, and that's, that's how you do it. And, and, you know, but making noise is just, um, ma making noise is basically just, you know, it's pattern interrupts. That's, that's what I talk about all the time is pattern interrupts. Like, that's why I have like, why do I have the, the, let's see back here, all these colors back here, you know, like, it looks good, but when I do ads, um, I can, I can boost the saturation and those colors like pop. And that's why I put, Hey lawyers at the top, you know, like it's cause it's, it's, I'm interrupting the pattern and by get, interrupting the pattern, I'm getting attention. Um, and then, 
you know, the other side of it is negativity always, always gets attention, unfortunately. But uh, uh, Grant Cardone did something uh, a couple months ago. Um, he's a big real estate guy and he's, you know, huge into, I mean, he's got, I think he's got a billion dollars in, in real estate holdings. I think I, I could be wrong on that, but I, he's got a, a ton. Right. Um, and he put out this video. He couldn't, he, he was saying he was, he was having trouble getting, getting, uh, recognized. So he put out this video that he's going bankrupt and that he, he losing everything and he's selling his private jet. Um, and it was all, it was all, it was all, all a lie, but that went viral. And a lot of people were like, you know, that, that went really, really, really far. And it's because it was negative. It was something bad happening to him. So everybody jumped on board. I don't know how, I don't know what that information means to you, <laughs> but I mean, I didn't, I didn't do anything negative. I don't, I don't particularly like that. Um, especially for him because he has a ton of investors and he didn't tell any of his, inv and most of his investors are people that just invested a couple thousand bucks with him. Um, and he didn't tell any of them that he was doing that. <laughs> so everybody panicked that they lost all their investments, but he made a lot of noise and uh, he got a lot of attention for a little while. So that's, that's another way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Did you hear about that chase? The, 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 I, ban the Grant Cardone bankruptcy thing? I didn't actually. Oh really? Funny. Yeah. I followed him. So, uh, that's funny. I didn't hear about it, but, yeah. but, uh, we got another question from, uh, Megan. Um, she asked, or she said, we have a number of free booklets available for PDF type, type, type download, but don't get tons of downloads. What's the best way to draw attention to those videos, Facebook ads, or both? For, well, what's the, yeah, what's the, can, can she tell us what the title is? Yeah, well, she says, we're criminal defense, so the topics are seven rules to survive a Florida DUI, for example. Okay, and how do they currently message it? Or how do they currently... Uh promote it did she say she didn't um yeah megan um if you're available on here can you tell us how you're promoting it now yeah so i can tell you what we're doing right now that's working like ridiculously well for an attorney in um uh northern virginia i think he's in um and and basically we're just running facebook ads and we're targeting people that have interests that are like you know, nightlife and alcohol and drinking, <laughs> like, you know, basically, uh, and we did some, some really detailed Facebook targeting. Um, you know, I think it was nightlife, uh, alcohol. Um, you know, we, we named a bunch of the different alcohols, you know, Budweiser, Heineken, uh, Jose Cuervo. I, I can't even think of all. Um, uh, she says, we mostly don't promote it super often other than drawing our email list to them. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's probably just, the, it probably doesn't get downloaded much because you're probably just not putting a lot of attention to it. The title actually sounded pretty good because most of the time it's the title that's the problem. The title is really like the headline, right? So I think it was something like seven, seven, seven secrets to surviving a DUI in Florida or something like that. Um, so if you create a, like I would create a Facebook ad, I would run it to those target, those, those, uh, th those interests that I was just talking about. Um, and then, you know, you want to go on and you want to say like anyone who's ever, uh, anyone who's ever had a glass of wine or a beer with dinner can get a DUI, you know, and, um, if, if you've, or, or no, here's what I would say. I would say if you've ever had a beer or a glass of wine with dinner, then you have probably been, you've probably risked getting a DUI. Um, here are the seven, th the seven secrets you need to know that the police won't tell you about how to beat a DUI and how to keep yourself out of as much trouble as possible. So something like that, you know? Um, and then if you just run ads to it, I think, I think it would work well. I think the, usually the headlines are the problem and, and the title that you have is pretty good. Yes. Yeah. Just wondering if we can step our game up. Yeah. I mean, honestly, you're probably just not, you're probably just not showing it to enough people is, is probably the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she has not asked a question, so uh, you have a book for her? Yeah, hold on. I got a bunch of random books in here also. I guess I could pull them up here so I don't have to keep... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, let me see. Uh, let's, go with, uh, let's go with the E-Myth, the E-Myth Revisited. So this is a really, really, really good book. Um, I don't know... I, this book's really, really interesting because it's basically talking about how just because you're a good practitioner does not mean that you're a good business owner, uh, which is completely true. There's a lot of people that you're a great lawyer, 
but that doesn't mean you know anything about marketing or HR or payroll or uh, just running a business, you know, <laughs> like, um, and I, I see a lot of people kind of run into that issue a lot where they're a great lawyer and they started their own law firm because they wanted to, because they're a great lawyer, but the business sense doesn't necessarily trans translate over is what I've seen. Yeah. So uh, the e-myth revisited. Awesome. Yeah. So we'll get that out. Megan, if you want to uh, drop your address in the chat, we'll get that out to you. So just going through some questions for people who haven't <laughs> asked any yet. Uh, Carrie asked a question last time. Um, that she had to leave, but uh, she's torn between whether to advertise her prior paralegal experience um, as a, on her website. Seems like it would give her credibility, um, but she's only been an attorney for a short amount of time. I think we went over that last time. Didn't we answer that question last time? Yeah, we I did. thought we did. We did. So, uh, yeah, you can see the, the other Q&A for that answer. I can be happy to uh, send that to you, Carrie, but we did go over that. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll give you the short answer. Yeah. I mean, like if you've been, I think she's been a lawyer, a lawyer since 2012, but she's had like 20 years of paralegal experience. I think, right. I mean, the marketer in me is going to combine that and say, I've got 29 years of legal experience. You know? <laughs> like, so, uh, I mean, cause like, it's not like you were a paralegal and knew nothing, you know? Um, right. that, that's, that's the short answer is yeah, I would definitely do that. And oh, 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 that was right. Where seven years is not really like seven years isn't a, it's not like it's seven months, like seven years is a decent amount of time to be an attorney. Like I wouldn't, if somebody said I've been an attorney for seven years, I wouldn't look at that and think that, Oh, they're clearly inexperienced. You know, like I wouldn't think like they're just down to law school. I think, okay, they've got some experience, you know, seven years is a long time. Yeah, that's true. That is a long time. Uh, let's see. Dave had a question here. He's been a bankruptcy attorney for 30 years, created a podcast called the financial wellness podcast. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on how to use your techniques to find more listeners for his podcast? Yeah. Who are you targeting? Dave. Uh, let's see. He's a bankruptcy attorney. So mm -hmm. uh, Dave, who are uh, Dave Hagen? Who are you targeting for your podcast? Or you want to drop that So down. what's interesting is that we don't actually target, I don't actually target or I don't actually promote my podcast at all. Um, but I have a podcast and it's typically like, rehashed uh or actually no i do some some specific episodes but a lot of times we'll take content um that doesn't that i've created that doesn't necessarily need to have video to go along with it and we'll just turn it into podcast episodes mm -hmm. um and we get we get a lot of downloads um and and basically it, it's it's basically by getting people into my network um and essentially you know, I get them on my email list, I follow up with them. And then, and actually we really don't even promote the podcast very much, do we Chase? We should probably, we should probably promote it more, shouldn't we? No, we don't. We, we do have a link to it on um, the website. Uh, so under the videos and everything on the blog post, there's a link there. Uh, we promote it, promote it in the Facebook group. Um, but yeah. Other than yeah, that, but we really don't promote it that often. Yeah. Months, like, yeah. So, yeah. So I guess it's people just finding me, I guess I'm probably not the best person to ask about how to promote a podcast. Well, <laughs> really what you do is like get people to follow you. Um, and then, or, or honestly, you could run Facebook ads directly to the podcast. Um, or you could go on other people's podcasts. That's something else you could do that would work really well. Um, another thing you can do is you can get people that have audiences, <clears throat> excuse me. You can get people that have audiences of their own to go on, um, to go on to, to interview on your podcast and get them to uh, promote your podcast. Um, and like, you could even do a co-promotion type deal. And I, I've done this before where basically like once you start and it's a building process, it's not always going to happen overnight, but if you have stats, right? Like if you've got a, a decent number of stats then you can use those stats, you can go to other people with other podcasts that are also targeting the same types of people as you. And you say, Hey, um, my name's Dave. I can't remember. I think it was, I think it was Dave. Um, you know, I've got this uh, podcast, we get 10,000 downloads per month, we get, you know, this, we've got, you know, all these subscribers and all that type of stuff. Uh, I'd love to have you featured and, or, you know, I'd love to do like a co-promotion where, you know, I get featured on yours, you get featured on mine, stuff like that. Like you can be creative and a lot of, a lot of podcasts. And, and, you, and when you could say is also, you know, I'd be, uh, I'd be willing to promote your podcast, the episode that I'm on your podcast to my list of, you know, 500 or 5,000 list readers or whatever it is. Um, 
you know, and, and in exchange, you know, I'd, I'd hope that you would promote yours to mine and basically work deals out like that, where basically you guys can be promoting each other. Um, that's a good way to do it. That gets easier when you have bigger numbers. Um, but uh, that's one way you can do it. Another way you can do it is run Facebook ads actually directly to, we did that, right? Did that work? Did that work when we ran Facebook ads directly to the podcast? It did work for a little bit. We stopped doing that though pretty early on. It wasn't like a huge spike, mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't also that expensive to run. We didn't, we didn't really focus on it, I don't think though. Right. Um, another, another thing is uh, naming the episode of the podcast. That's one thing that I found. It's like everything else. You've got to have a really, really good uh, curiosity-driven name for each episode because um, I've seen that basically there's definitely a correlation with, view, with downloads and listens and how good of a name that the individual episode has. Uh, the one, that, one of the best ones I did was like my, my anonymous interview with a fine law employee. And that I still think to this day, that's probably the best, the biggest episode I've had. Um, and it's because it was a really interesting title that people really wanted to hear. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And yeah, you can, you know, use your, your audience that you built up as a bankruptcy attorney for so long and do that. I also uh, know a guy who had a, a pretty successful podcast and he went to a different podcast that was in the same vein as he was trying to do and went through all the episodes and looked for the people who were on those episodes, reached out to him and they wanted to be on his podcast too. So he just scooped up all of those guests and it helped him build the podcast. Up. That's a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it helped him build it a lot quicker. Because you you know, another thing, another thing you could do is you could advertise on other people's podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. That's you know, true. Because that's because uh, you're reaching people that already listen to podcasts and are already interested in the types of podcast, you know, in the subject and, and most of the podcasts that, most podcasts do not have that many listeners to the point where they're charging thousands and thousands of dollars for advertising. I mean, like for like a couple hundred bucks, you can probably get some decent ads on some podcasts and, um, and, and probably draw them over to yours. But again, you know, it's all about making sure that there's some curiosity, making sure that there's, you know, a reason, a benefit that that's enticing them to get over to your podcast. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and that was for Dave Hagen. We have not given him anything. So all right. So he gets the one thing. So this book, I'm trying to see what this bookmark is. Oh, I don't know. That's, <laughs> good, that's this is a good book. I read this a couple of years ago. It's basically just saying how you need to focus on the one thing that is going to make the biggest impact rather than focusing on a lot of things. Awesome. It's a good book. Awesome. It's, oh, you know, you know what it is? It's written by the guy who started Keller Williams Realty. Right. Yeah, I know that's a, a popular one. I think his name's Keller Williams, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Keller. Something Ke Keller. Is it Keller? I think so. Keller yeah. Papasan. So his name, so there's a Williams. It's not Keller. It's Keller and Williams. I think so. Yeah. Gary Keller. Gary Keller. That's what Gary Keller. There you go. Dan said that too. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. So we got a question from Anne. She says she's a criminal defense uh, for juvenile and adults. Started sending a follow up video out by text a day or so after a consult. Learned this um, uh, from a webinar someone sometime over the past few weeks. Is it better to be more detailed or more general in these? Should I say it a day after or two days after? Uh, Anne, are you trying to get reviews with that or, or are you trying to? You mean you're talking about a follow I think she's talking about follow up. Oh, okay. um, and when she says general or more, what do you mean? Like more, like more personalized or like, what do you right. mean? Is it better to be more detailed or more general or should? Uh, oh yeah. The more personalized, the better. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'll think about it. You know, it's like if somebody sends you, I mean like one end of the spectrum is uh, hi client. Thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you for coming in to talk to me about your case. I really hope that it was informative and I hope that we talk soon. Right. Versus, uh, hey, hey, Bill, thanks. Uh, you know, wanted to tell you, I really enjoyed our conversation uh, about, you know, I, 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 really, well, I don't know if you want to say it, if it's juvenile defense. <laughs> hey, Bill, uh, you know, uh, just wanted to follow up with you, see if you guys had any more questions about uh, the vandalism charges, uh, you know, and see if I can help you with anything. By the way, I actually looked into that one issue that we talked about, and I found out that here's, you know, here's what you need to know about that. 
Um, another thing I was thinking about is if you have any, you know, is that, you know, you've got options where you could do this or you could do this or you could do this. Um, so, you know, if you have any more questions, let me know. I definitely would love to represent you guys. Um, you know, and whatever, I mean, basically it's just much more personalized. It's like having a real conversation with a person, you know? So that's, that's what I would do. I, I would definitely do personalized. And that's actually a really good idea the I'm sending a video message after a test, after a, a consultation. Um, I actually have not done that before. I always said, uh, you'll get more people to show up to consults if you send them a message like that. Um, but, um, I really like the idea of following up. That's actually something I may borrow for a future marketing video. Yeah, that is a really good idea. All right. Um, Randall, um, it's 2.45. Uh, do you want yeah, to? We got, yeah, let's do one more question because I've got another Q&A three. Yeah, yeah, let's see. I'm trying to see if anyone does mm. not. Okay, uh, so Randall have one more. He had, uh, as a cr local criminal defense attorney, he had 20 year career in law enforcement before practicing law given all that's going on right now, what's the best way to get a reporter or news agency to interview you as a resource expert? He hasn't had any luck with Haro, uh, even the paid version. Okay. Um, yeah, what I would do is I would uh, keep an eye on the news and I would just start commenting. Like, so, so basically, reporters use typically Twitter. Um, so go on Twitter, start you know, tweeting information to them that's actually valuable information. Um, start recording video, like on, you can do, I think the, the time limit on Twitter is two minutes and 20 seconds. Is that how long it is? It's either two minutes or two minutes and 20 seconds. Yeah. I think it's um, two. yeah look up to see what the, the length of, of Twitter is. And when they post information, get, film a video that provides additional information that will be helpful to them. Because here's the thing, at the end of the day, if you can make their job easier and give them really good information and they know that you're going to be a good source for them, then they're going to keep coming back to you over and over and over and over and over again because they know that you can just give them information. So just start sending them information. That's, that's the biggest thing I would do. Stuff that's actually going to help them provide additional, you know, provide additional information and enhance their stories. Um, now, don't do this. Like, don't just record a video if you don't have anything to say about it because then you'll just, you want to make sure that everything that you get from them or everything that they get from you is really, really valuable and adds and, 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 and is going to help them because it, it, it's human nature. If you can make someone's job easier, say, make someone's job or someone's life easier, then they're just going to naturally gravitate to you. And that's, that's what I would do. We have clients that have done that. I actually have one client that called it the stickle maneuver um, because they, they, they do, they handle dog bite cases in Boston or they're in Boston. They, they handle dog bite cases. And um, there was an attorney or there was a, a reporter that, just kept covering dog bite, you know, dog bite stuff. And he just kept sending her information. And eventually she started interviewing him. And now every time there's a dog bite that she covers, he gets, he gets the interview. Um, and it's cool. Cause I, I believe, I believe it's a TV station. Um, so he gets on TV, he gets linked from the web, the website, he gets to throw as seen on, you know, whatever news station on his website. And it works really well. Cause that's the cool thing is once you develop the relationship one time, then that relationship will continue to, 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 to work for you over and over and over again. The hardest part is, just get, is, is developing the relationship. It's not that hard. The secret is you have to be consistent. You have to understand that just because you do it one time doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to reciprocate. You got to just be consistent. And, and that's the easiest way to do it. Um, if you're looking for reporters, you can go to Google. Uh, you can like Google and then search like your local ABC, NBC uh, affiliates. Um, you can also do national, you know, CNN. And, and, and basically, uh, there's, a, there's a website called Muckrack, which is M-U-C-K-R-A-C-K. -K. Um, it's kind of expensive. I think it's like several hundred dollars per month. But you can, it'll actually list, like you can put the, the news organization, so you can put CNN, right? And it'll bring up every single reporter at CNN, their Facebook, their Instagram, their Twitter, their email address, um, and the thing that's cool right now is that most reporters do not write, most reporters are freelance. So they don't just write for the Washington Post. They write for Washington Post and the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times. You know, they write for all these different. So if you can start getting in good with these reporters and you can start getting featured in all of these different places. So um, I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> it was how to get in with the reporters, right? It's, it's yeah, that, that, so that's what it is. It's, but you also, the biggest thing you have to remember, I cannot stress this enough, it's likely not going to happen the first time. It's probably not going to happen the second time. You got to be consistent with it, but it will work. I promise you it'll work. Human nature says it'll work. Yeah. And they're looking for help. So uh, the easier you can make it for them. Uh, the better. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Cool. 
All right. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you everybody for hanging out. Um, and we'll do this again next week. See ya. Have a good one. So we'll talk to everybody soon. All right. See you guys.